Hello students, this video is being recorded in the summer of 2020, right after the end of the spring semester and in the midst of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. Since we do not yet know for sure what format our classes will take in the fall, and since there's some likelihood that at least some of us, both students and faculty, will have to be away from campus for a time should the mitigation plans prove ineffective or should compliance with or enforcement of public health guidelines prove impossible, I am preparing a video version of each of my lectures for the class to have it ready if and when it is needed. It's also the case that necessary distancing requirements in the classrooms may make it impossible that the entire class can be in the same room at the same time. In that case, those whose turn it is to stay away from campus may find these video lectures a better option than relying on a live classroom feed via Zoom or some other technology. So if you're watching this video, it means that we are, for reasons of public and personal health, still unable to meet together in a traditional face-to-face -face classroom format. All the same, I'll continue to do my best to teach you what I know with whatever tools I have at my disposal. Enjoy the lecture. So now we will move to discuss the third of the argumentative categories, the categories of interpretation. And that concerns similarity argument forms and the fallacies that go along with that particular category. We'll also discuss a few additional fallacies that don't fall neatly into one of the three categories of interpretation. So when we think about similarity arguments, keep in mind what Richard Weaver and his colleagues said in the article, Looking for an Argument. Uh, they remark that in using likeness or difference, we argue from one case to another, unlike the practice in induction, where we argue from a large number of particular cases to a general rule or law. So in other words, with similarity arguments, as we move an argument from what we know to what we don't yet know, we're looking at particular cases and the the case that we know well is a single instance or a particular case, but it has some similarities with the case that we don't yet know quite so well. And so we're using the known case to inform or instruct us about what's likely to happen in the less well-known case. So the first type or form of argument in this category is the argument by analogy. And an analogy is a comparison of particulars based on perceived similarities. That is, in part, the audience has to recognize that yes, indeed, the two cases being compared have some obvious similarities, which warrants the comparison so in an analogy, we reason from a known case to draw conclusions about another case that is less well known. And the analogy is warranted by both the number and the degree of the similarities that are perceived between the two particular cases. So there are two types of analogies. There is what we call the literal analogy. And with the literal analogy, we have two cases that are compared that are drawn from the same class or category of persons, things, objects, ideas, and the like. That is, the two particulars come from the same realm of experience. And so because they are of the same category, or same class of things, the similarities may be more obvious. But then there's also figurative analogies. And a figurative analogy is used for illustration. It can help clarify uh, a point in an argument, but it doesn't function as evidence. Why? Because in a figurative analogy, the comparison is made across categories. That is, uh, 
they are, the two things compared, the two particulars are literally speaking dissimilar, but they may contain some similar properties uh, or elements, and that allows them to be compared for the purpose of illustration, description, or clarification. So this will perhaps be made more clear when we look at some examples. So the literal analogy, comparison of particulars from the same category, figurative analogy, comparison of particulars from different categories. So this is one of the key differences here. Literal analogies can serve as argumentative evidence. That is, when warranted, a literal analogy provides a model or example which enables us to reason about the likely outcome of the particular instance or case that we're making a claim about. But figurative analogies do not have evidentiary value. They serve as illustrations. They can emphasize, clarify. They can be persuasive, but they are not evidence because there's no literal, literal correspondence between the particulars at work here. So here's a couple of examples. First, the literal analogy. During the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic, there was an initial outbreak followed by a period of diminishing infections. Then a second wave of infection occurred, which killed more people than the initial outbreak. So we should be prepared for a similar second deadly wave of COVID-19. Now in this instance, we have a known example the historical example of the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. And that's the known example because we know what happened. We know um, what occurred. We know when it occurred. We know the number of people who died. We know how the infection was spread. We know about the different efforts at mitigation that worked and those that didn't work. So it's the known case. We don't know everything about COVID-19. We certainly don't know what's going to happen as we go forward through the next year or two until there is a vaccine that works that can be widely distributed. But we can reason about what is likely to happen or what will probably occur based on the known case of the 1918 pandemic. It's not uh, an argument that says every single particular is exactly the same, but there are enough similarities between the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic and the current pandemic of COVID-19 that we can certainly draw some lessons from that historical example and make reasonable predictions about what will occur in this case. And we can do that because we recognize that the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 and the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 are in the same category. That is to say, they are similar respiratory illnesses that spread in a similar way, that have uh, affected people across the globe. They have killed millions of people. And so we see there are obvious points of analogy between these two pandemics which are from the same category. If we want to think about the category, the category would be global pandemics. And so that allows us to reason on the basis of the known case uh, to make a prediction or a claim about the current circumstance. But then let's take a look at a figurative analogy. If you wrecked your car, you wouldn't want the government telling you which auto body shop you had to bring it to for repairs. Neither should we permit the government to decide for us which doctors we see when we are sick or injured. Now, of course, in this case, you can see that there are some parallels or similarities between the two particulars, but in fact, the two particulars come from different categories or classes of experience. 
wrecking your car is not exactly the same as getting sick or injured, right? Going to an auto body shop is not the same exactly as going to your physician. But if we want to think about um, suggesting or proposing an attitude toward government control in our lives, we can use the particular case of the government telling us where to have our car fixed as an example or model for teaching us something about the attitude we ought to have toward um, government controlled uh, uh, health care or government controlled medicine, right? And so we see this comparison across categories of experience it can be illustrative, it can help us clarify, it can even be persuasive, but it doesn't function as evidence because literally speaking, an auto body shop is not the same thing as a physician's office. So with any analogy, we would test whether that analogy is warranted or not. And the tests are pretty simple because all analogies are based on perceived similarities. We would ask the question about the quantity of the similarities and also about the quality of the similarities. So with regard to quantity, we want to know, are there a sufficient number of similarities between the two particular cases being compared. And with regard to quality, we would ask, are the similarities between the two cases significant and concerned with the most important aspects of the cases in question? So if we go back to our Spanish flu uh, analogy, we could ask, are there a significant number of similarities between the two pandemics. We kind of outlined some of those, and it seems to me if you look at the historical case and the current case, there are indeed quite a number of similarities between the two. But then we could ask also, are the similarities between the two cases significant? That is, are they concerned with the most important aspects of the cases in question? And again, if you look at that analogy between the two particulars, the Spanish flu pandemic in 1918, the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, it seems that indeed the things that they have in common, the two particulars have in common, are among the most important things. That is, um, methods of tra uh, transmission of the disease from one person to another, the tracking of the outbreaks, the the spread of the outbreak from one country to another, um, the particular um, infection that the virus creates in the human body, that is the type of sickness and the way people die, right? They are all very similar. And these are important aspects when comparing uh, cases like that from that category of pandemics. When we have an analogy that fails these tests, that is to say, an analogy where there aren't very many similarities, so it fails the test of quantity, or there might be some similarities, but they're not on regarding the most important aspects or elements. That is, the similarities aren't about the significant aspects of the two cases. Then we would say the analogy is not warranted, that is, it would create the fallacy of the false analogy. So a literal analogy argument can be answered, that is in rebuttal or in response, a literal analogy argument can, by, can be answered by showing that the similarities are either few in number or insignificant or both. So the way that you attack an analogy is by showing it's a false analogy and you show it's a false analogy because it has only a few or no real important similarities. So a false analogy is a claim or a fallacy that's based on an unwarranted analogy. That is one that lacks both a significant number
and the most important of the similarities between the two particulars. So here's an example of a false analogy. We should not hold a massive student Black Lives Matter protest in Durham. Just look at what happened to the Chinese students who protested in Tiananmen Square in 1989. So in this case, obviously we have two experiences that come from the same category in the sense that we have a, a reflection on two potential student protests or the um, potential student protest in Durham and the known case of the student protest in Tiananmen Square in 1989. But we also have uh, the comparison of two cases that are different in very important ways. That is to say, um, Tiananmen Square, the Tiananmen Square protest was put down by a repressive communist government, right? And it was put down with um, significant military force, uh, including uh, the um, slaughter of uh, several hundred of those student protesters. And so um, that's quite a different circumstance than what we are likely to see in the town of Durham, New Hampshire, should there be a, a protest um, regarding Black Lives Matter in the town of Durham. So because of the differences, we would say, well, yes, certainly there are similarities. There were students and they were protesting and maybe they were even protesting policies of the government but the differences between the two circumstances make that analogy unwarranted. So we would call that a false analogy fallacy. So here's another um, form of argument from the similarity category, and that is the argument from precedent. So this is a variation on the uh, argument from analogy, but in this case, the species of analogy argument takes as the known case one about which there has been an authoritative judgment. So this kind of reasoning is common, for instance, in legal appellate arguments. So decisions of the Supreme Court, for example, become precedent cases. That is, the Supreme Court decides a case with a particular set of facts and the decision in that particular case becomes a guiding or authoritative judgment for other similar cases that come along after it. And so it is an analogy between particulars, but in the argument from precedent, the known particular also um, carries with it a kind of authoritative judgment. So here's an example. Based on the case of Vermont versus Smith's Butcher Shop, it is clear that the state of New Hampshire may exercise its authority in regulating the slaughter of animals in residential areas without violating the rights of individual small business owners. So in this case, we all obviously have a, a law case in New Hampshire regarding the slaughter of animals in a butcher shop that takes place in a residential area. And the question seems to be whether the state of New Hampshire has the authority to regulate that kind of activity. Well, it isn't simply a comparison of another case in a different state, but it's a comparison with another case about which there has already been an authoritative judgment. That is, a court has already ruled on the case of Vermont versus Smith's butcher shop and ruled that the state does in fact have that regulatory power. And so because of that previous authoritative ruling, the same principle would apply to a similar case in New Hampshire. And so that's the argument from precedent. Then there's another variation of the analogy argument, and it's called the argument by degree. Sometimes this is called the a fortiori argument, and also sometimes the super analogy. 
It's called a super analogy because the argument by degree involves a comparison of unequal particulars. So if we're thinking about the two particulars compared, for instance, in the pandemic example, right, the Spanish flu pandemic and the COVID-19 pandemic are alike. That is, they come from the same class or category of things, and they have a lot of similarities. In this case, we are comparing things from the same category, but we're comparing things that are obviously unequal. And we're trying to predict the outcome of the lesser known case by knowing what happened in the particular case that we're using as our model or example. So it, uh, in the argument by degree, it's this comparison of unequal particulars, but the outcome of the known case is less likely than the predictive claim concerning the particular case that is less well known. And it's less likely because it's unequal. And so this will be clear, I think, when we look at a couple of examples. So here's some other things about the argument by degree. The argument by degree is warranted by the common knowledge or experience of the audience about both the similarities and the differences between the compared particulars. That is, the audience recognizes that the two things are not exactly equal. That is, that they are unequal in some way, that one is more likely than another to get a particular outcome. And that factors into how the audience reasons about the argument by degree. The audience then contributes some knowledge about the probability or likelihood of a predicted or alleged outcome for each particular. So knowing the less likely thing has already occurred, we are convinced that the more likely thing will also occur. So for instance, suppose there are, there's a an argumentation class with 30 students in it, and we have on the one hand, um, a student who is a very poor student, maybe a GPA of 1.5 overall, um, who hasn't passed any of the quizzes so far in the class, uh, who struggles just, just to complete ordinary homework assignments correctly and all of that. And yet we find that that student, the poor student, gets an A on the next argument quiz. But we also have in the class um, maybe the class valedictorian or the one who uh, has the 4.0 GPA, the presidential scholar, the one who's taking all the honors classes, who seems to never get anything wrong on any of the homework, right? And so if we know the poor student has gotten an A on the quiz, what can we predict about the very good student on the same quiz? The less likely thing has already occurred and so the more likely thing we are convinced will also occur. That is, if we know the poor student got an A, it's almost for certain that the excellent student will also get an A because we've compared unequals, the less likely thing has already occurred and so we reason about the likelihood of the more likely thing. So here's another example. The Foundation for New Hampshire History funded the project on the history of Serbian immigration to Manchester in the 1930s, even though the Serbians were a small community. I am confident, therefore, that they will fund the research into the growth of French-Canadian immigration in the city in the late 19th century, since by 1900 nearly half the working population was of French-Canadian descent. So in this instance, an argument by degree or an a fortiori argument, the less likely thing has already happened. That is, the Foundation for New Hampshire History ha has funded a study of Serbian immigration, even though the Serbians are a relatively insignificant immigrant community in Manchester or in New Hampshire. And so will it be likely then that they'll also fund a study into French Canadian immigration, right? Indeed, if the less likely thing has happened, it's probably 
the case that they're much more willing or will be much more likely to fund a similar research study into a much more significant immigrant community in the history of Manchester, New Hampshire. So the argument by degree. Here's another example. The student who copied the Wikipedia article was given an F for the course and a one semester suspension. So I think it's quite likely that the student who plagiarized the dean's own essay will probably also get at least an F and a suspension. So we know what happened in the one case, the known case, the Wikipedia copier, right? That person got an F and that didn't involve plagiarism of the dean's own work. So if that happened in a relatively speaking, maybe less significant offense of copying Wikipedia, how do we think the dean is likely to respond in a case where the student plagiarized the dean's own essay, right? So the less likely thing we know has occurred, so we can predict at least the same will occur in a case that is of more significance or more, sefe more severe as a violation. The argument by degree. Here's a forensic example. This actually um, goes all the way back to classical rhetoric. It one was one of the examples used in training forensic orators. I've updated it a little bit here, but last year he was convicted of stealing money from his own mother. So why should we doubt that he was responsible for the theft from a neighbor he barely knew? So in this case, the less likely thing, stealing from your own mother, has already occurred. So it should be more probable that the same individual would be inclined to steal from a neighbor that uh, he or she did not know very well. Then we have the reciprocity argument. And again, we're thinking about the comparison of particulars, but we have here at work a kind of innate or natural sense of justice, which members of the audience bring to an interpretation or understanding of the two particulars being compared. So the reciprocity argument is a quasi-logical form that relies on the unstated common sense presumption that particulars in like situations should be treated alike. So all things being equal, two people in the same circumstance should have roughly speaking the same outcome or should be treated alike. So this might be the first argument that you learned as a child because it emerges from that natural sense of justice or equity. So if you grew up with siblings and maybe your father came home from work and brought some candy or a present for your brother or your sister and didn't bring anything from you, you might feel a sense of injustice or outrage at that outcome because as we know, uh, parents are supposed to love and treat their children equally and one child has been favored over another and you would respond with that sense of innate injustice. You might even say, that's unfair, right? And so that claim or that protest of that's unfair is revealing of that innate sense of justice. And so when we base an argument on, the, on that uh, presumption of like particulars being treated alike, that's the reciprocity argument. So here's a couple of examples. You allowed one customer to use the expired coupon to pay for her meal at the restaurant. It's only fair that you also allow me to use the coupon as well. So in this case, two people in the same circumstance asking for the same consideration, right? That's a, re a, a form of reasoning where the two particulars are compared, they're found to have similar circumstances, so the expectation or the presumption is that they will be treated alike. Second example, the exchange student from Brazil was granted an extension on his paper 
because of his language difficulties. Is it fair that I should have to submit the paper on time just because I'm supposed to know English well? Well, in this case, there's an attempt at a reciprocity argument, but obviously the analogy fails. So it would not work as a reciprocity. It would be an unwarranted claim to reciprocity or an unwarranted claim because of the, because of the comparison here reveals important differences between the exchange student from Brazil and the native English speaker who's asking for the same consideration. The important difference, of course, is that the exchange student is not a native English speaker. So that would be a very good reason to extend um, some consideration to that student, which would the other or native English speaking student should not be entitled to. So there are attempts sometimes at reciprocity arguments, which again, we could attack by showing that they are indeed false analogies. So here's some now additional fallacies. These don't fit exactly into any of the categories of being or cause or similarity, but they're important to note and to be familiar with because they're again commonplace fallacies in public argumentation. And perhaps one of the most uh, familiar is the ad hominem argument. The ad hominem literally means at the person, right? That is, it's an argument addressed at the person rather than at the substance of the opponent's position. So instead of attacking what the person says, you attack the person or his or her character. So, so as in the example here, we cannot trust what the candidate says about the state budget, for she had an extramarital affair and once smoked marijuana. But you notice the reasons for the claim that we cannot trust the candidate have nothing to do with what the candidate has said about the state budget. It's not like we cannot trust what the candidate says about the state budget because her math is all wrong. Rather, it has to do with things that happened in her past. It's an attack on her character rather than on the substance of the opponent's position. So this is a commonplace argument in American politics, sadly, much more common than it should be in American politics today. And it's used by all sides against all manner of opponents in American politics. But when you see, uh, whether it's in social media or on the news or in political commentary, you see uh, members of one party attacking candidates or politicians in another party and attacking them for aspects of their character or their person uh, of things that they've done in the past rather than talking about um, what the person is doing or their policy proposal or the evidence that they've advanced in favor of a particular course of action, then you may, you may have an instance of an ad hominem fallacy. Then there is uh, the emotive language fallacy. And the emotive language fallacy is a fallacy that uh, attempts to argue and it seeks a reaction based on emotion, which is induced by particular language use, rather than a conclusion formed on the basis of evidence. So um, in this case, you're looking for, in, again, a commonplace kind of fallacy, uh, especially in our divided political environment of American politics today, where people substitute um, the emot e emotional language uh, and passion of their position for evidence in support of their position. And that emotional response is often induced by the use of particular kind of language. So look for those cases where someone is obviously using particular phrases or, or constructions of language that are meant to elicit an emotional response, an emotional response and that emotional response is meant to stand on its own or apart from any evidence in support of the claim that's being made. 
It's not to say that emotion is unwelcome or passion is unwelcome in politics. Indeed, that's often very important. But the passion should be based on a rational foundation. The passion should be based on what can be shown to be true through evidence, right? It cannot substitute for truth or it cannot substitute for evidence. That is, emotion by itself is insufficient as evidence. So we look for these instances of emotive language fallacy. So here's an example. Wildlife in the Gulf is being slowly choked by the stinging discharge of corporate greed and the moral bankruptcy of unrestrained consumerism. We must end oil drilling in the ocean to preserve the planet for our children. Okay. Well, that might be a good proposal, and there's probably lots of good scientific and political evidence in support of that proposal, but you can't substitute mere language for that kind of evidence, right? So in this case, that's what would be happening. You have obviously emotional terms, slowly choked by stinking discharge, right? Bankruptcy, moral bankruptcy of unrestrained consumerism which again is designed to elicit a kind of an emotional response but by itself offers no evidence and instead aims to just be a substitute for evidence. And finally, we take a look at a fallacy called amphiboly. And amphiboly is a fallacy based on exploitation of a grammatical ambiguity. That is, it's a statement that could mean more than one thing depending on how it's interpreted, or it's a statement that is unclear, and so depending on which side of an argument it might uh, advantage, it is interpreted in one way rather than another, so that um, that ambiguity is exploited for persuasive purposes. So here's a brief example. Um, the anthropologists went to a remote area and took photographs of some native women without clothing, but they weren't developed. Those anthropologists should be arrested for producing child pornography. Now in this instance, of course, the ambiguity comes from the ambiguous referent for the pronoun they, as in they weren't developed. Are we talking about here the photographs not being developed? Or are we talking about the native women who were photographed uh, not being developed? And if, of course, if it was the people who weren't developed and they were without clothing, then that could constitute pornography. But if it was the photographs, then there's no problem. So we would exploit that ambiguity in making the claim that the anthropologist should be arrested for producing child pornography. Um, here's a few more sort of classic examples of amphiboly. Last night I shot a burglar in my pajamas. Therefore, everyone should keep their pajamas tightly secured. Or used cars for sale. Why go elsewhere to be cheated? Come here first. Thanks for your term paper. I shall waste no time in reading it. So, for instance, take this last example. Thanks for your term paper. I shall waste no time in reading it. Does that mean I'm going to get right on to the task of reading your term paper? Or does it mean I'm not going to spend any time, that is not waste any time, even reading it? All right? So we exploit uh, a grammatical ambiguity. This, again, is a fairly common fallacy in American political discourse and news coverage. So I want to talk about a fairly recent example, a real-life example, where this has occurred. You may recall uh, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, back when the White House was doing daily briefings, that the president said, and I then I see the disinfectant where it knocks out in one minute, and is there a way you can do something like that by injection inside or almost a cleaning? Because you see, it gets in the lungs and it does a tremendous number on the lungs. So it'd be interesting to check that. So you're going to have to use medical doctors, but it sounds interesting to me, so we'll see. But the whole concept of the light, the way it goes in one minute, the way it goes in one minute, that's pretty powerful. 
So this became obviously a real controversial statement by the president. Um, it was immediately, it, it, and, and again, if we look at this, we can say, okay, well, we could interpret that a variety of different ways. But as PolitiFact pointed out, if you read the transcript, the actual transcript of what the president said, right, the briefing transcript shows Trump did not say people should inject themselves with bleach or alcohol to treat the coronavirus. He was asking officials on the White House Coronavirus Task Force whether they could be used in potential cures, right? But the fact that it was an ambiguous statement or open to interpretation or could be interpreted in a disadvantage, uh, disadvantageous way for the president uh, created the opening for the president's adversaries to exploit, right? And certainly this is what they did. Here are just some of the headlines that followed in online news sources the next day, all saying that the president had suggested or recommended injecting bleach or injecting disinfectant to cure the coronavirus. And of course, as we saw in the transcript and as PolitiFact pointed out, he didn't actually say that. And it would only be by um, a kind of malevolent interpretation of his words that we could arrive at that kind of a conclusion. But that's the problem when ideology so um, influences our interpretation of political discourse and news. You can see this too was quickly turned into a variety of different social media memes, all again implying that Trump had recommended the injection or the consumption of disinfectant or bleach for the purposes of curing the coronavirus. And again, as the transcript shows, he doesn't actually say that, right? And of course, this is a bipartisan fallacy in the sense that Republicans use it against Democrats as often as Democrats use it against Republicans. So here's a recent example also dealing with the coronavirus. We had Joe Biden appearing on The View, and Biden, of course, has been notorious for lots of speech gaffes and uh, saying stupid things um, and nonsensical things. Um, and here was a recent example. He was asked by one of the participants on The View, are you at all concerned, as Trump said, that we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself? Biden noted in his reply that the COVID-19 cure will make the problem worse no matter what. Now, as the news story pointed out, no one from The View followed up for a clarification, which would have been a good idea because it's obviously an ambiguous answer at the least. Uh, it doesn't seem to make any sense. It seems to say quite the opposite of what Biden should have said, right? But even though no one on The View followed up, social media didn't let it go, seizing on it like a dog with a meaty bone. Here's one example. This was a tweet. Um, number five bad t TV moment of the day for Joe Biden. Um, and notice that the... Um, that the commenter says, I honestly don't know what he meant here, right? So we start with this ambiguous phrase and then we see also how that very quickly gets exploited, interpreted in the least advantageous way for the particular candidate. And so uh, amphiboly then is a grammatical fallacy. It's a grammatical fallacy that exploits um, a grammatical ambiguity. And of course, we all know this is why grammar matters, right? Just the presence or absence of a comma and the whole meaning of the sentence can change. So if you have any questions about these argument forms or fallacies related to the similarity category or the other additional fallacies that we discussed, please post your questions to the discussion board and don't eat grandma.